All right, Sherry Turkle, welcome to the show. My pleasure. Uh, so your latest book is Reclaiming Conversation. Um, and you've written about how technology and communication and humanity uh, intersects because uh, you're a professor of social sciences and technology at MIT. Um, and I'm curious, you know, you've, you've warned about the ill effects that technology can have in our lives and your work. Um, I'm, have you always had a, a wary eye towards technology or was there a time in your career where, like most people, thought that things like the internet, texting, email could improve communication, make society better? Well, I still think that the, that the internet and um, can make society better. And I think it does in many ways make society better. Um, but I, um, I think that we have to use it in ways that um, will make sure that happens and just, you know, be more discriminating because I think we use it in some ways that are making our, our lot worse. But there was a time when I, you know, was less aware, I think, of the, as we all were, of what the uh, problematic, uh, the problematic issues were, so I think I was more sort of generally enthusiastic, um, and that was really when you know when things began. You know, I would say up to the mid '90s, when the the part of the internet I focused on was how it allowed us to play with issues of identity, and that was very exciting. And um, I still I still think that that's a very um, thrilling part of the internet. Uh, we've seen the dark side of that. We've seen that people, when they're anonymous online, can become very cruel. Um, but it certainly is the case, you know, that anonymity is not just, uh, doesn't just allow you to play with identity. It allows you to feel no accountability. And that's, you know, that's something that we've all learned again with practice, you know, in this medium. But um, I would say that through the 90s, I was I was more an enthusiast uh, than a critic. And um, then in terms of my own biography, my own intellectual biography, I met two technologies that, that sort of took me aback and made me, um, you know, more critical. And those were sociable robotics, robots that pretend to have empathy, robots that say they love you, care about you, um, that pretend they have a relationship with you. I think this has some very toxic effects. And, um, and also, um, I began to see the downside of what I call always on, always on you technology. You know, something like our phones where because they're always on us, always on our bodies, we tend to turn away from the people we're with uh, and turn towards our phones. And so I became more focused on looking at these two technologies and, you know, kind of taking the measure of the problems that they are causing us. And what led you to conversation? Because I think all of us intuitively understand that we're not very good at having conversations. Um, But what led you down this path to look at how technology has affected the way we interact face-to-face and having conversations? Well, the... What sociable robotics and always-on technology have in common is that they take us away from conversations that count. If you give your child a Hello Barbie, which is a robot doll that says, Hello, I love you. Talk to me about your sister. I have a sister. I'm jealous of my sister. Do you have, you know, (laughs) pretends to want to have a conversation with you about your sister? You're not talking to your child about her feelings and therefore cutting off a conversation that might lead to really the development of empathy, the development of relationship in a way that talking to a robot doll is never going to do. And similarly, if you put a phone down on a table between two people who are having a meal, research shows that the empathy between those two people, literally the connection they feel toward each other, will go way down. And the things they will talk about will become more trivial because it sort of makes sense. We we don't want to share... Um, much of ourselves, if we feel we're 
uh, going to be interrupted. So not only do we talk about things that are more trivial, but we also um, but we also uh, feel less connection with the people we're with. And neither of these things are good. Neither of these things are good. I guess you also talked about how um, there's research showing out, showing now that young people are becoming less and less empathetic, and that might be because of smartphones and internet communication. Yes, there's a 40% decline in the um, in every way we know how to um, judge empathy among college students in the past 20 years, with the greatest decline being in the past 10 years. And we have every reason to think that's because of um, smartphones. But, you know, it, it, it makes sense because we're, you know, empathy is born in, in the conversations, in the conversations where you look somebody in the eye and you, you know, you, you sense their body, you sense their, um, you know, you sense their, their, their pauses, their stops, their starts. I mean, you're really, you know, you're really paying attention uh, to them. And, you know, that's not going to happen if you interrupt that conversation to go to your phone. And it turns out that 89% of Americans say in, in the most recent study that um, in, in their last conversation, they, they took out a phone. I mean, they literally say, you know, my last social interaction, I took out a phone. And 82% say that it deteriorated the conversation. So this is something that we we know we know that we're doing to each other. We know is not good for is not is not good for our conversations, but we're doing it anyway. But we don't have to. In other words, I'm very optimistic because it turns out that in only um, five days at a summer camp um, without phones, those empathy numbers come right back up. Um, and uh, we can reclaim conversation and reclaim empathy and reclaim the kind of con- the kinds of relationships that that we deserve to have with each other. So it sounds like empathy is a lot like a muscle, right? You use it or lose it. Absolutely, absolutely. Empathy is what we're pre-wired for. In other words, the muscle is there, you know, to be used. It's it, it's a design to grow, but if you don't use it you you won't have it. Um, it's like an apology. When you apologize to someone, um, you know, so much work is done. So much work is done. You get to say, um, I'm sorry. You get to see, um, uh, you get to see the other person feeling sad and hurt but they get to see you being sorry, then they feel compassionate, and then you see that there's an opening because they feel compassionate so that you can use that opening to to make a space for something new to happen. It's really fantastic. I mean, it's really fantastic. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's really... Uh, uh, fantastic! All of the um, uh, all the things that can happen in in an apology, um, but that can't happen so, online, right? Or, or a text message? No, um, it can't. It, it can't. Yeah. Unfortunately, it can't. Well, and uh, I, I think you know. There's, I'm sure there's people out there, and you probably heard these counter arguments that saying, "Oh, well, you know, we're over romanticizing." conversation you know we, we forget about the awkward silences and the angry outburst and the tediousness of you know asking well you know, what do you think of the weather today you know small talk you know and technology eliminates that right with apps like tinder uh people no longer have to figure out uh can i is this person is can i make the transition from just being friends to you know romance because everyone on tinder is already there for romance you don't have to worry about small talk because you got to swipe uh text messaging Eliminates. Uh, you can answer when you're ready to answer. But well, but see, all of this. I mean, my, you know, I want to be in conversation. Um, I want to be in conversation with these people because they have something wrong, and it reminds me of my students who don't want to come to office hours 
but who want to send me an email asking me the perfect question so I can send them the perfect answer back. They're, they're turning what should be a rich conversation into a transaction. Mm. They're forgetting that, that what's supposed to happen between a professor and a student is, is not that they're going to ask me the perfect question. <laughs> I'm going to give them <laughs> the perfect answer. But that, um, but that on the contrary, they're going to give me the imperfect idea and I'm going to say, hey, um, that's not a great idea, but I'm going to stick with you and talk with you and we're going to have a relationship and we're going to make this better. Yeah, so it seems like and, we... And that's what, that's what they're missing. That's what they're missing. is They're missing that, um, that these conversations that they're calling small talk, um, you know, um, they're, these are the, the, what these, these are the non-transactional conversations where you build a relationship, get to know about another person, um, uh, you know, get to understand how somebody else thinks, um, that's the business of conversation. It's not. It's not. A, it's not an algorithm. And I. I think that I'm arguing for, um, you know, the work that conversation can do. That is not the work of an algorithm. Yeah. And you know, Tinder is an algorithm. Yeah. Um, you know, and and I'm not saying that it doesn't get two people together to meet, but once you meet. Um, you, you better be ready to talk if you want to have a, um, you know, a conversation. I mean, it seems like um, the the friction that happens in conversation opens up, I guess, spontaneity. And that's something I, I feel all of us want control over everything, aspects of our life. And with conversations, sometimes you can't control that. Um, and it feels scary. Uh, but at the same time, it opens up new opportunities because you might go somewhere you didn't think you were going to go before. Yeah, I think that a lot of um, a lot of what people are afraid now about is spontaneity. I mean, I talked to one young man about conversation and why he, he would do anything to sort of avoid it. And he said, I said, what's wrong with conversation? He said, conversation? I'll tell you what's wrong with conversation. It takes place in real time, and I can't, you can't control what you're going to say. It takes place in real time, and you can't control what you're going to say. Um, uh, and he was so right. And yet, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And yet, he was seeing that as a bad thing. And I think that our phones make us, I, I sometimes say they make us three gifts as though they were gifts from genies, you know, kind of powerful, benevolent genie, but who sort of didn't understand much about people and what they really need, which is that, you know, we, we never have to be alone. We can put our attention wherever we want it to be. We never have to be bored, uh, you know, and, 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 and we never really have to deal with our vulnerability. And actually those things, even though they feel so seductive, they're really not that great for us to live like that. And I think that's kind of the challenge is that we're offered possibilities that really aren't that great for us. And that's what we're struggling with now. It, it seems, uh, I think you made this analogy in your book too, too is it's sort of like uh, nutrition uh, was maybe 10 years ago. Like we're, we all love fast food. It's delicious because it has that fat and we're primed evolutionarily, you know, because of evolution to seek that out. But we have an overabundance of it now. And consequently, we, we've gotten obese because of it as a society. Is it the same thing with information? Like we, we feel drawn to having these sort of sips of conversation via text and email. Yeah. Um, but in the end, it's not very good for us. Yes. And also the analogy to... A fast food actually gives me um, is interesting because it also gives me a little hope, paradoxically, 
because, um, you know, I was raised by a mother who thought that, you know, giving the best nutrition to her precious little sherry was, you know, white bread and I remember it had these balloons on it and each balloon stood for a different vitamin that was <laughs> injected into this white yeah. bread somehow. And it had, um, I had like soup that mostly tasted of sugar and salt. Those were its main flavor. I, you know, it had some tomato flavoring, I think, but I think it was mostly sugar and salt. And then I had um, a fruit in a sort of base of sugary syrup. I mean, I, I, I really, this was, if I, I had a, a daughter and if I had fed her these foods, I, I would have, you know, the only excuse would have been that I was doing like a madman retrospective or something. I mean, you know, I would have been like considered an abusive mother. So gradually, you know, we, you know, that was industry telling Americans, you know, what it wanted us to eat. To, to feed a kind of new industrial model of of what of what of how they were stocking um, supermarket shelves, um, and Americans, you know, in this culture, gradually, and it's not completely, it hasn't completely changed yet. But gradually, people said, you know what, I don't think so. I actually don't think so. I don't think I want to eat like this. This really doesn't feel. Um, this doesn't feel so good. I don't, um, this isn't feeling good to me. Um, and, and gradually people changed their food habits. So, um, I, I think that we are at a moment when we are actually ready to change our, um, our phone habits because so many people that I interviewed we're not happy campers. You know, it's not as though, you know, people criticize my work and say, oh, my gosh, she doesn't appreciate how much we know from the Internet. I really do. And I want to continue using all that great stuff that it gives us. But we use it in some ways that really are making people quite um, unhappy with their lives. Like, I, I'm, I'm thinking of this one father who I interviewed who who um, who talked about giving his older daughter a bath when she was a younger girl, you know, when she was a toddler. Now she's 11. And now he has a two-year-old and he doesn't, when he gives her a bath, he just leaves her in the bathtub and he sits on the toilet bowl with the, you know, with the seat down and he does his mail on his iPhone. He doesn't even talk to her. And he says, this is terrible. Those conversations I used to have with my older daughter, those were the best. That was incredible. That was the most, you know, those were the most, that was the best. And it wasn't just that he liked them, but I mean, as a psychologist, I know that he was, that's where you teach empathy. You know, that's how it's done. That's how you teach, you know, a kind of continuity of, of parental care and how to have a conversation and not to be afraid of a spontaneous conversation. Intimacy, I mean, that's where all that work is done. And, and now he just, <laughs> he's, he's miserable and his daughter isn't getting what she needs to get. So, um, uh, you know, he's not happy. And, um, and so I think that people are really ready for a change. I mean, that's the, that's the bottom line. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that even younger people, you know, people who are particularly like 14, 13, 14, 15 year olds, whose parents, you know, were texting at breakfast and dinner, whose, whose dads never took them for a walk to the corner store without bringing their phones. You know, these are kids who are ready for a change. These are kids who are ready for a change. Yeah, I thought that was interesting, the interviews you did with the younger people. Like, they were the ones who were instigating, like, they were telling their parents, like, get off your phone, you know, we're at dinner. Yes. <laughs> that was so bizarre, because usually you think it's the other way around. No, I, you know, I think that that's a misperception because, you know, we think, so many people say to me, well, how do they know to do that? Because they never knew anything different. And this, this is on this model that somehow, you know, young people need to be taught that uh, it would be a good thing for their parents to talk to them. So that's like the model, that they've never had it, so how are they going to know that it would be a good thing for their parents to talk to them. And I can see why, you know, we get into that um, way of thinking. It's like, you know, it should be a cognitive learning that your parents should talk to you. 
But it turns out that kids really just want their parents' attention, and and they seem to know and crave it um, without you no know, in a culture where they don't have it. So I I can just report that from the front lines that that this that this desire seems to pop up um, even without um, even when parents don't give it. Uh, children seem to want it. Or on the playground, you know, um, parents sit there with what, one of my big advice points to parents is that if you cannot, if you simply cannot um, spend, you know, spend three hours on the playground with your kid paying attention to them because you have too much to work to do on your phone, don't go to the playground for three hours, you know, stay home. That's okay. And go go to the playground for um, a half hour. But what's terrible, I mean, what's awful is is parents who are, um, who are, um, who are, who are, who are going to the playground and with their children sort of begging them to, to pay attention to them. And these kids are like being ignored. So stay home, do your work, and keep your phone at home when you go to the playground so when you're there you can pay attention to your kid. It's the same thing at, you know, at, at school games. You see, you see the parents who have gone to the school game, you know, or are, they've gone to the school game. And, um, but they go to a school game and then at the game they're, they're texting. Um, and it, it's bad. Yeah. Uh, they're there, but they're not there. They're there, but they're not there. And kids realize it, and they're quite, you know, they're quite upset. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, most people have a tendency to think of conversation as part of, you know, our personal lives, and that, yeah, we should make more, take more measures to ensure that we have more of these face-to-face moments with our family and our friends. But you make this interesting case um, in your book that we need to do this in business as well. Um, why? How? How is it that face-to-face conversations can improve business productivity and profit- profitability? Because most people think, well, you know, the sort of the cooler talk and things like that, that's just a waste of time. They should be on their computers getting stuff done. But how can these face-to-face spontaneous conversations at the office help us be do better work? Well, the, it's, it's great you asked that because dramatically, dramatic new research has shown that face-to-face conversation is good for the bottom line. It increases productivity. It increases creativity and collaboration. And it, uh, it, companies that make room for it make more money. So the work of Ben Weber, who's a colleague of mine, he, he, he began at MIT and now he has his own company, but he, what he did was he actually put badges, I mean, sort of electronic, interactive, highly interactive badges on people, sensing badges that sensed, you know, if they were having conversation, what kind of conversation, who they were having conversation with. Um, and, um, and he found that, 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 that those workers who talked more to their coworkers um, were more productive. Groups of workers who talked together were more productive. Giving workers a coffee break at the same time increases the productivity of that whole group. Um, and one of the least productive things you can do, it turns out, is the thing that makes you feel more productive, which is going into your office, putting on your headphones, or going into your cubicle, putting on your headphones, um, laying out your one or two phones, um, and, you know, opening up your screen with all its windows and, you know, starting in on those emails. Uh, one, um, one lawyer, um, who I spoke to called that the pilot in the cockpit, you know, so the lawyers who do that are the pilots in the cockpit. They're not working with their colleagues. They're not, they're not really getting done what needs to get done in the firm, which is working together, um, talking to clients. They, these people tend to avoid client meetings and prefer to send emails. And that is not how relationships form. It's not how really the work of the firm gets done. 
They don't go to the they don't go to the uh, lunch room to talk to their colleagues. They they stay in their office. They don't go to meetings with senior lawyers. You know to to listen to conference calls to see how senior lawyers conduct negotiations. They per, they listen to those calls on speaker from their uh, office so that they can multitask and continue to work on their email. It's a very common pattern. And we're, we, we think that we're being smart when we do that. And actually, we are taking ourselves out of the mainstream of what will make us successful, which is relationships, knowing how to talk to people, knowing how to close a deal, knowing how to be sensitive to other people and, and, and understand them. Um, and it, it reduces that think, spontaneity again, right? Again, again. And, and, and this, you know, the most successful people are not people who are dedicated to, to emptying out their inbox. They don't care about their inbox. They care about what they're doing proactively, what they're writing, what they're thinking. And the transactional and, and you know, and sort of um, responsive, reactive things that they can do with their inbox. Um, you know, once a day, once every two a days, once a week, you know, they'll put in some time. They're not irresponsible. But, but you know, my favorite tip to... Um, to people who want to be really productive at work is to send out messages that say, I'm thinking. Mm. And see, watch those messages. Watch people go crazy and watch those messages go viral. Now, it depends, of course, at what level you are in an organization. I mean, you know, you can't, you can't make this conversation revolution if you're just starting out. You have to begin to enlist um, other people to argue with you that you will be more creative and, you know, you have to work in a firm where you can work on changing the culture of the firm. But I think that there's more uh, support for this than, than, than many people think because firms are realizing. I mean, I went to one firm where, you know, that had studied, you know, the right size of the table in the cafeteria so that people would... Um, you know, would sit together and talk, you know, the right, how, how, how long a wait there should be on the, um, on the line, you know, in the cafeteria so that people would chat but wouldn't feel that the line was too long, you know, everything for conversation. In other words, they had read Ben Weber's research. They knew um, how important conversation was. And yet they also demanded that people that the highest value really was being always on the company messaging system. And that if you didn't respond to a message within, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, a half hour, somehow you weren't showing devotion. Mm. And you can't have it both ways. Yeah. And that company, you know, is starting to, you know, there's a lot of pressure there to, to turn things around and to, you know, if they're going to talk the talk, they have to walk the walk. You, you know, conversation really has to be a way of life within the culture of the company. It can't be slogans or cappuccino machines or micro kitchens. Yeah. It really has to be how you run your business. Yeah, I thought it was interesting, too, how uh, CEOs are starting to implement basically like social skills classes for their newer uh, in newer recruits because these young people yes. are coming out of college. They just they have no they, they want to do everything by email or text messaging. Yes, that is very common. Yeah, it's very common to have um, to have CEOs saying, you know, I mean, several CEOs have said that you know they spend what they consider an unconscionable amount of time on uh, social. I mean, they don't even know how to put it. Kind of social uh, social Etiquette. skills training. Yeah. Uh, you know, just kind of getting people. Um, into, uh, um, you know, getting people to um, be together and, um, um, you know, hang out with each other and apologize to each other instead of sending each other crazy emails yeah. constantly. 
Yeah, I've had um, those. Which is what they were doing. Yeah, I've had those exchanges. I mean, I work from home, um, and so I, a lot of people I work with are it's remote, and I guess that's another problem, right? Uh, more and more companies have uh, decided to do this whole remote working things. It makes it more productive. It saves money. Uh, but in the process, like it, it sucks up my time. I've had email exchanges, like a, a chain of emails that was 60 emails back and forth when like a simple phone call could have gotten the problem solved in five minutes. Uh-huh. But like people, no one ever thinks, oh, let's just get on the phone. It's just, let's just keep doing email because this is comfortable. Yes. Um, I thought this was interesting too. You make this point that besides making us less empathetic, our technology, and I'm not just talking about smartphones, I'm talking about the services that we use to communicate. So Facebook, Instagram, all that, Snapchat, um, it changes the way we present ourselves to the world. Um, we sort of self-censor. And, but why is that? And some people say, why is that so bad? I mean, shouldn't we you know, self-reflect before we self-reveal um, things to, to other people? Or, but, but why is that bad, if it is bad? Well, you know, every, everything in its place. I mean, you know, I think this is an example where you, wanna, you want to sort of step back and take a deep breath and say it's a matter of degree. Um, I'm presenting myself here to lots of people, um, there's a degree of natural editing, um, so it's natural that I self-reflect before I self-reveal too much, and that's good. Um, if I'm on Facebook and I'm presenting myself to a public it's natural and good that I self-reflect before I self-reveal. The problem is that we've gotten into thinking, and people do that. They present their, you know, the best meal, you know, yeah. <laughs> the best meal. They don't, they don't, you know, they have lunch at McDonald's with a, you know, with a, with a greasy. With, with really greasy fries. But it looks and great on Instagram. And yeah, I mean, you know, the whole thing. And then, But then for dinner, they go to, you know, something really elegant, and they're taking pictures of that elegant thing. And, you know, they, they're at some sort of, you know, hotel, hotel, hotel nothing. But then, you know, when, when they do something special, all of a sudden they're at this, you know, fancy hotel. I mean, in other words, you, you present a sort of souped-up version of your life. You know, part of my author tour is very elegant and really nice. And then, I mean, really, part of it is like, I, you know, uh, really terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, if I was if I was on Facebook, you know, telling my followers about my tour, I, I you know, I don't think it's the two o'clock in the morning, kind of dragging myself through through places that are kind of grungy that I, you know, would really feature. I want to look glamorous. I wish I would do the one where, you know, the hairdresser and the makeup artist are leaving the hotel, you know, and I'm about to be interviewed by, you know, somebody awesome. You know, that's that's more what I would post. But we all do this, and that's fine. That's fine. If we remember that Facebook is a public place where we're presenting a public self, where we want to be or, you know, a kind of um, polished up version of us. Um, That's not, but that's not how we start to talk about it. We start to talk about it. Like this is where we have our friends. This is the place for our social life. We're going to, you know, this is, this is our, this is where I talk to my besties. Um, And we start to look at that profile as though it really matters that this is somehow where significant social encounters are happening, not your PR campaign. In other words, we're chatting as part of my, you know, publicity for my book and trying to get, I really believe in this conversation. I want to start a movement for conversation. I think that childhood and work and medicine and law I mean, politics need conversation. I mean, I'm on a, I'm on a tear, you know? Yeah. So naturally I'm going to, you know, edit. But when we do it, when, we, when we're presenting these kind of, you know, edited selves, when we, when we think we're in our most intimate relationships, 
and we start to talk about Facebook as, as, as part of our intimate life, that is when it becomes a problem. If people talk about Facebook as part of their personal publicity campaign, uh, it would be, yeah, that's right. But they don't. Yeah. They talk about it as where they see their identity. And what I found is that people look at Facebook and they see this reflection of themselves that they can barely recognize. And they begin to feel this fear of missing, this, this, this way that you call it, fear of missing out, FOMO. FOMO. Yeah. yeah, and they begin to feel it about their own lives. Like, hold on, who is this person yeah. who has this glamorous life? You know, is that me? <laughs> Is that me? I don't think so. But I, I put it, you know, you become jealous of yourself. And that's not a good, I mean, alienated from your own experience. And that's not good. Yeah. That's not good. That's really a problem. And you make a, a bigger case, though, with this self-editing thing that it, it in, in the end, can affect democracy in a lot of ways. Because people are, because they're constantly, we're aware that anything we could say at any moment or do is being not only surveyed, you know, being um, watched by the government or corporations, but it's being watched by others. And there, you say there, there's a tendency for people to self-edit maybe a controversial idea because they don't want to uh, suffer the consequences that could come from that idea, whether it's their job or their social life or whatever. Absolutely. This is one of the most, I think this is one of the most important um really one of the most important um, parts of my book, uh, which is where I discuss um, the, um, how should I say, the, 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 the implications of the way we're living now for, for democracy and the question that we're not asking ourselves enough of not only can there be intimacy without privacy, but can there be democracy without privacy? And I, I talk about a young woman who, who says to me during a time of tremendous political unrest in the United States, I mean, it was a, a moment where a lot of things were happening politically that really were, there was a lot to talk about. And she said to me, and this is a woman who had just graduated from an Ivy League university, a brilliant young woman about to go into financial services, on top of her game, I mean, so smart. She'd majored in economics. I mean, she's so smart. Um, and she said, I'm glad I don't have anything controversial to say. I'm glad I don't have anything controversial to say because I'd have to say it online because that's the only place to talk. And it would be public, and I, that wouldn't be good. In other words, she is she's making sure that she doesn't have anything controversial to say. She's making sure she doesn't have anything controversial to say. Because saying something controversial would be inconvenient. Yeah. And and that's how we're living. And 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 um and not only that, but there are these there are very interesting studies that show that we post I mean, getting back to the Facebook effect, I mean, online we post what our follow what we think our followers will like, and that leads us to what's called the spiral of silence, where we're posting more and more of what we think other people will like. So we're you know, we're hearing more and more of what people think we'll like, and we're we're saying more and more of what pe- we think people will like. I mean, this is not. This is not good. Yeah, so Mikhail Foucault got it right that uh, yeah. we would uh, all oh, yeah. self-edit ourselves. That's, that's how tyranny would come. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this is a new kind of so. This is a new kind of. I mean, this is this is a. It's it's kind of taking it to a higher power in yeah. a way. You really are. Yeah. Well, I, let's let's talk about sort of brass tacks about how you reclaim conversation and you, you, you leave some great tips, but I thought it was really interesting. The start of your book, you, you, you say, make the case that one of the first things you have to do to reclaim conversation is to reclaim solitude. And I thought that yeah. was interesting because, you know, there's all these research. And I, I think people confuse solitude with loneliness. Your, your previous book was called together alone or alone together. You know, we're all feeling more and more lonely. So why would solitude be the first thing we need to do to reclaim conversation? Well, uh, uh, solitude is not loneliness. Solitude is 
is kind of the opposite of loneliness. Solitude is when you are content with yourself. And solitude is not that easy to achieve. I mean, you achieve solitude actually by being in conversation when you're young. I mean, ideally when you're young with someone who leaves you a little space for your own thoughts. And so gradually you become more at peace with being with your own thoughts. And, you know, you can think back to a grandfather who took you on walks and who just gradually, you know, held your hand but just then didn't chat with you much. And you each were in your own mind, but he was there. Um, My grandmother used to take me for walks in Prospect Park, and we chatted a little. But basically, we, we looked at the pigeons, fed the pigeons, I mean, she taught me a kind of contentment in my own mind. Um, That's solitude, being comfortable with your own inner dialogue. Now, that's not loneliness. And it's interesting that we learn solitude when we're, you know, by, by first being with someone else and comfortable with our own self when we're with someone else. Mm. But let me get to your question, having defined solitude of what it means, of why it is that solitude is the pathway to conversation because and and relationship. Because if you're content with who you are, you can listen to another person and really hear what they have to say instead of needing to project what you need to hear onto that conversation with them. So we all shun people, and actually they're technically, they're called narcissistic personality disorder people, but we don't need to have that you know, name for them, but we technically want to stay away from people. We, we instinctively want to stay away from people who don't know who they are and who want us to somehow tell them who they are. Um... And we're comfortable with people who know who they are and who can listen to us and be in relationship with us because they let us be who we are. And that's what you want to achieve, to be in relationship. And that's what you're looking for in conversation. And so, um, uh, you're, the pathway toward relationship passes through a capacity for solitude. And that's why I get into, I don't want to say fights, but there's a misunderstanding of my work. Uh, And not just my work, but of this very important point by people who say, okay, let's give Turkle this, that it's good to, um, it's good to be, um, uh, it's, and maybe it's not good to take out your phone when you're with another person. Let's grant her that. But what's the trouble with taking out my phone if I'm alone? I mean, what does that hurt? Why would that bother Sherry Turkle? <laughs> you know, what, <laughs> what, 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 what is she, what's her problem with that? And the reason that it's a problem is because if you don't develop the capacity, if you are always looking to be stimulated and can't be alone, you will always be looking for somebody else to tell you who you are, to stimulate you. You'll, you won't be able to develop this capacity for solitude. And as a matter of fact, there's, a, there's an incredible um, new study that showed that after six minutes, people without a device who were just asked to sit quietly without a device or a book begin to give themselves electroshocks <laughs> rather than just be willing to sit alone without a device. Wow. I mean, that's kind of where it's come to. And that's that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, it sounds like the, the phone makes us other-directed. I guess it was Reisman that I talked about in The Lonely Crowd? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, Reisman. Yeah. Reisman, yeah. Absolutely. Other-directed to a, I would say, other-directed to a higher power. Other-directed yeah. to a... To a degree that he never would have been able to anticipate. Yeah, he wrote that 50 years, like in the 1950s, so 60 years ago. Yes. So, 
Yes. Didn't think about the internet. Well, um, Professor Turkle, before we, we head out, I mean, I'd love for you just to leave some, I don't know, some action points. I always like to end podcasts this way, but anything that people can do today uh, to reclaim conversation in their own lives. Besides the solitude thing, I mean, we got this. I think that we've figured out the importance of solitude and uh, the nuance of your argument there. Um, but anything else that people can do to reclaim conversation? Absolutely. Um, I don't believe in you know have, you know people spending so many hours doing this or so many hours doing this, but I do believe in spaces. You in your car, no devices. You're not no texting for you, you're driving, and no devices for anyone else in the car. The car is a sacred space for conversation. If people in your family complain, you just say, or friends, you just say, you know, it's really important that I talk to you, and the car is really a great place for that. So in our family, this is how it works. And try not to wait until your child is 15 or 16 years old to make <laughs> to, to explain this. But if you explain this to a relatively young child, that this is just how your family culture is, they will accept it. They'll be okay with that. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, sacred spaces. Um, uh, and then at work. Sacred spaces at work. No matter what level you are in your organization, the same... <laughs> designing for conversation in the workplace has to be part of how we think about work going forward. Getting rid of this idea that the pilot in the cockpit is, 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 is working, is the best way of working, that that's the person who's really accomplishing stuff. That would go a tremendous way toward reclaiming conversation. Just getting that out of our minds. I, I just gave a, a talk the other day, and, and somebody stood up, and he says, but, but after listening to me, he says, but isn't it really that, don't you get the most done when you just have your earphones on and you're just at your screen and doing your email? And I just looked at him, and I said, no, no, that's not when you get the most done. That's not all the research is showing. That isn't when you get the most done. And the third thing what would be to get rid of multitasking, um, we, we've, we've kitted ourselves long enough. We all know that multitasking is, is, is interfering not only with conversation, it's interfering with productivity, and it's, it's inhibiting us um, from, 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 from really from knowing ourselves and from knowing what we think, and, and we um, are distracting ourselves, and, and really unitasking is the next big thing. And conversation is a human way to practice um, unitasking. So that's another big thing. And, you know, my favorite is like author's choice, just to end up, you know, my, my favorite line in my book is sure. that conversation, you know, that, that, that technology makes us forget what we know about life. Um, that father who is, is, te- is texting and doing his emails when he's giving his daughter a bath, he knows he knows that he's doing something that isn't good for his child, and he he's doing it anyway. So accept your vulnerabilities and design around them, and uh, conversation is there to claim along with a better relationship to each other and to politics and to the world. Fantastic. Well, Professor Rickle, where can people find out more about the book? At um, www.reclaimingconversationbook.com. Fantastic. Well, Professor Turkle, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. My my pleasure. My guest today was Sherry Turkle. She's the author of the book, Reclaiming Conversation, The Power of Talk in a Digital Age. And you can find that on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Go check it out. Fantastic book.